Hi everyone, welcome to our 37th video session. Today we'll be speaking with Parisa Shirazi um, from Marquette University on time banking. But before we get started, let me introduce what we do at Impaction and a little bit about video sessions. So Impaction makes the social impact space more accessible for young people um, and leaders around the world. Um, and the purpose of video sessions is to ultimately get everyone from around the world to speak about a topic in social impact, solve challenges, and even interview social entrepreneurs who are making a difference. Um, so we're aiming to make the space more accessible virtually um, for influential leaders around the world by students, business professionals, um, leaders who are working in the social impact space and who are interested in making the, be the world a better place for, uh, for others. So um, we're really blessed to have everyone here today, especially during the time of COVID-19 and getting people to start thinking a little bit about action in their local communities. Let me just start with some introductions um, for myself um, and then we'll go around. Um, We'll go around and ask people to introduce themselves in two sentences or less. Um, so I'm Shivani, one of the co-founders of Impaction. Um, I also work at Chicago Public Schools, and obviously I'm based in Chicago. Jasmine, do you want to go next? Sure. So my name is Jasmine Jabot. I um, am a graduate student at Texas A&M International University and also work as a student leadership and engagement coordinator there. Happy to be here. Thanks, Jasmine. Bethany, do you want to introduce yourself? Sure. Hi, everyone. I'm Bethany. Um, I'm DC based. I currently work as a budget analyst for the government, but um, I also do am interested in evaluation and international development spaces. Awesome. Thank you. Daniel, do you want to go next? Hi, everyone. I'm Dan Heinegger. I'm based in Chicago and I work in the nonprofit field. Thank you. Uh, Ishan, do you want to go next? Hi everyone, I hope you are safe and well. Um, I'm Ishan, I live in London and I have a startup here which is called Travel Hands, work with the design for the visually impaired people with the visually impaired people. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Jennifer, do you want to go? Um, hi, I'm Jennifer Moreau, I'm from Orlando, Florida and I own a social enterprise called World for Good and we focus on elevating human rights. Thank you. Lacey, do you want to go? Yes, I'm Lacey. I'm based in Southern West Virginia and social media coordinator for Impact. Thank you. Maribel, do you want to go next? All right. Hi, everyone. I'm Maribel Rodriguez. I'm based in Washington, D.C. I'm from Brooklyn. I am the founder of Love for Immigrants and Arts Movement, and I also co-teach social entrepreneurship. Thank you. Thank you. Shorjo, do you want to go? So I'm uh, Shorjo. I'm based in Gujarat in India, and I'm in the ports and logistics space, and I'm interested in uh, making it more efficient for transporters and drivers to have a better life in India. Thank you. Syed, do you want to go? This is Sayyid Saudul Hassan from Pakistan, and I'm Vice Chancellor of uh, the SAMS Pakistan, uh, which is basically having a uh, work of training and consultations. Thank you. Great. Thank you. And Abdul Latif Lawal, do you think you can introduce yourself? Yeah, good afternoon, everyone over there. I'm Abdul Latif Lawal from Nigeria, the founder of uh, Discord Paint and Agrochemical. We are into paint production in agricultural raw material. Thank you. Thank you. All right, today we'll be learning about time making from Parisa. She's a program associate at the Center for Peacemaking at Marquette University. She helped establish and coordinate a time bank in Las Cruces, New Mexico, and she'll share how this model around time banking was pivotal to building social co cohesion and improving health equity in their community. Um, Parisa, that was just a little bit about you, but you can go in and introduce yourself and your work and with the presentation. Thank you. Great. Good morning, everyone. I'm so excited to be here. It's so cool to see everyone from all over the world, really, um, on this call. Like Shivani said, I am a program associate with the Center for Peacemaking at um, Marquette University, which is in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. About 
three years ago now, um, I had moved to New Mexico, um, specifically in the border region of the U.S.-Mexico um, border. And so I'm going to pull up my presentation. All right. So I want to start off with what time making really is. So this model um, was started actually in Japan um, in the late 70s. And it was formally founded here in the States in 1980 um, by an attorney at the time. He was working with a lot of clients one-on-one, -on -one, realizing that there was a lot of injustices in um, society and came to realize, yeah, he may be winning his cases and supporting people in a certain capacity. There was such deep structural inequality within our society that there needed to be pivotal change and he really realized that it came down to our economic systems and how they were structured. And so he started to explore this alternative economic model known as time banking. And so um, it really, Time Bank USA, which is the larger group now, um, really became formed in the 90s and it's all around the world. Um, so what is time banking? Time banking is a model that really looks unique to every community that um, creates it, but there are some core tenets and values that I'll go into. Um, but what it looks like for most um, communities is an exchange of services. So a lot of these time banks have an online platform where people are able to create um, an online profile. You usually fill out a membership form, some groups do background checks on the people who are able to join um, their groups. We and the time bank that I helped create, we did not. Um, and we can go more into why and why not. Um, and so people join this online space. Let's say it's like a Facebook profile page. So you have your own profile page in this um, database. And you are able to share on your profile Hi community, these are the things and skills and traits that I have to offer to my community. And then there is a second um, list where you list the things that you are in need of. And people are able to go onto your page and see what are the needs in the community and respond to you. And um, you're able to do the same with others. So an example of that. So for instance, um, in the time bank that I was a part of and helped create, I would offer to cook meals for people. I'm an Iranian woman. Um, I love making Persian food. And so I would go to people's homes and I got invited for a birthday party once to create um, a meal for a group. Um, I've made meals for people who are bed rest. And in exchange, I um, at the time didn't own a vehicle and needed rides to the airport because I traveled. Um, and people would give me rides to the airport in exchange. And so how our time bank worked was that for every hour of service you would provide, you would get one time bank credit. So that credit would be shown in your profile. So you can see how many credits you have and you're able to then use those credits um, to acquire services that you're in need of. And no money was involved in this. This is an alternative economic model. Um, and so I'll go more into what that model really looks like creating it and more in details about that. But overall, the Time Bank mission um, nationwide and as well as globally um, is to promote equality and building caring community economy, economics through inclusive exchanges of time and talent. And so currently um, they are in 34 countries. There's 500 time banks in the U.S. alone. Um, so there's probably one in your state if you're here locally. Um, Ashan, you said you're in London. It's really thriving in London, actually. I was on multiple calls with folks in London, um, Japan, South Korea. New Zealand's really big in it as well. Um, Sweden. And so it's just cool that there is this um, U.S support for it and build, as well as um, global network calls. So if y'all are interested in joining these global network calls and seeing what it looks like in each community, I would really recommend you all to visit timebankusa.com. Um, and so there are five core values to time banking. 
And just so that I don't forget them, I had written them all down here. Um, so I'm just going to go through each one. So the first one is asset. Um, so the core of time banking is to really provide people with this really perspective of we are all assets of this community. We all have value. Um, and I think that was the most powerful part of my experience of creating a time bank of being with people and having conversations with them that really um, got them to that point where they realized hey I am an asset um, we worked with people who had just come out of serving time um, in the local prison systems to people who had been on the streets for years and um, to elderly who were in their 90s and would say things to me like honey I am so old what do I have to provide to my community. There's nothing that I can do. Um, and so that is really a core of the timing of everyone's an asset. And then redefining work. Um, how do we value revitalizing neighborhoods to um, advancing social justice? How do we put a price tag on that? And so these time credits are designed to um, reward and recognize and honor this type of work that usually isn't um, honored um, in our money economy. And then reciprocity, it's a two-way street. Um, I really love this value. It's something that really um, challenged me when I was a timing coordinator. Of, I've always been this person that I want to give, give, give. And it really challenged me to take a step back and understand that I need to ask for help too and be open to receiving. And so we worked a lot with our community members of how do you be in a space where you're open and willing to both give and receive. Um, and then social networks, building these um, core social networks, strengthening your community, building trust um, was really important as well. And lastly, respect, um, striving for respect. Um, like I said, um, our timing was in the border region. So we had newly um, arrived migrants in our region. We had um, like people in um, Ciudad Juarez, the um, Mexican community that was right across the border who would come into um, the region for sometimes periods of a time um, because students were studying or whatever their case may be, staying with a family member. Um, and there is language barriers, there is um, all the cultural differences and how do we build a culture of um, respect um, was really important for us. Here are just a few photos um, of my time in the time bank. So here is my team. Uh, Carrie Bachman was the director of Doniana Communities United. So Doniana Communities United was the organization that I worked for when I was living there. Um, it is a grassroots organization that's dedicated to health equity work. And so health equity, what does that mean? For us, it really meant to be, um, put it simply, how do we look at the social determinants of health? So meaning um, the factors within our communities. How does our zip code influence our health? How does um, access to parks, to grocery stores, um, the air pollution in our communities, how do all these factors impact our health? Um, and how are we as a grassroots organization creating, helping create new systems and structures that people will then have the opportunity to um, improve their well-being and their um, mental health and their just ability to be present within communities safely. And um, like Shivani said before, we also really um, tried to build social cohesion. So we came to realize that having spaces where people are able to be freely themselves and to grow and learn and to be loved is so important um, and vital to someone's health and well-being that we, when I started there, it was just uh, Carrie Bachman and I, a um, two-person organization. We actually worked out of her house for the first six months until we wrote grants and got an office finally. Um, but we decided, hey, we found this model online. Why don't we start our own time bank? And so our first meeting, we had about 10 people there. Um, I started in August of 2016. By the time I left, there was 220 of us, um, all on this online system. Some people weren't as active as others. I would say we had at least 80 really active people um, 
at once. And we're really proud of that. Um, we were able to gather people into our office space and make exchanges and really um, create opportunity for people to get to know someone that, frankly, they would never really interact with if it wasn't because of the pandemic. And so some images here, um, this top image is an example of the birthday party. So um, the lady in the middle, it was her birthday. And so um, Susan invited um, the woman in the blue. I don't know if you all can see my cursor or not. But she invited me over, she was a member of the Time Bank, to create a Persian meal that you can see down here for the ladies. So I taught them my recipe, um, my grandmother's recipe. Um, and we made this meal together. And it was really fun. And I got two credit hours for it. And Susan actually, the next week, drove me all the way to Texas to catch my flight. Um, the team down here is um, some folks. So a few of the folks in this image were formerly incarcerated. Um, two of the people in this image were living on the streets when we had first met them. Um, through our time bank, we were able to find them housing um, and connect them to the resources they were needed. And they ended up actually joining our leadership team. Um, and we were heading up to um, Santa Fe to actually attend a legislative meeting about um, social cohesion and community building, especially for um, those who um, were living on the street. And then Shawnee here in the middle, she was a graduate student who helped us. Um, she's an indigenous woman. We were able to connect with some um, indigenous communities as well in the area and um, build exchanges. One other thing that I wanted to point out too, being so close to Mexico, we actually did make trips to Ciudad Juarez. Um, they had a university there that students were able to um, really study alternative economic models. And so we added them all to our time bank and people would have Skype exchanges. They would teach us Spanish and we would send groups of people there. They would give us tours. And it was really a way for us to be able to, without any money involved, build connections, make people um, connected to communities right across this border wall that was present within our community um, and really make people during a time where 2016, a lot had shifted politically, a lot of fear. Um, I mean, we had so many ice raids in our community every day that people were scared to even go to the grocery store at that time. Um, that you were able to connect virtually and within um, one on one exchanges in a time of just distrust, anger, um, and unknown, the time bank had become really the strong force of love and care and, and shelter for many people. So, uh, I wanted to also share the power in um, inclusivity. So, some people who had come to our time bank were really scared of the fact that we didn't do background checks. And that was something that we were very um, keen on not doing. We came to realize that many of the people involved in our time bank would not be able to be involved if we did time uh, background checks. Like I said, many people had um, some criminal history background. Some people um, were involved in things that um, when they were very young um, and now they were later on in life. And still we came to um, an agreement within our leadership team of if we truly want to build community, all people need to be involved. And it's not fair for us to say, hey, because you've had this experience or have made this decision in your life, you are no longer going to be allowed to be a valued member of society. And so time banks around the world um, really utilize their um, community in different ways. We really try to connect with elderly, um, like I said, people who are on the streets, university students, people across the border. Some people focus very niche. So the time bank in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, they focus really on providing care to the elderly. Um, whereas a really thriving time bank in Dane County, Madison, Wisconsin, um, they have thousands of people in their time bank. They really connect with a whole congregate of people from churches to schools um, to the point where Madison County, the mayor actually um, really became intrigued by this um, model that the city council um, they took it upon themselves to allocate a part of their budget to creating um, a tr uh, transportation coordinator, 
align for a transportation coordinator in their local time bank so that they can just coordinate rides for cancer patients to hospital um, for their chemo um, therapies. And so people were giving um, cancer patients free rides and then um, cancer patients after they healed and recovered were also able to give to their um, communities. I could keep on going on and on, but I also want to provide space for people to ask questions um, and I would love to hear your thoughts as well. Yeah, thank you, Parisa, and that presentation was great and really informative. Um, I know you kind of touched on it, but can you tell us a little bit about the demographics um, of the people who are typically providing services and the people who are receiving services? And I know it depends on um, like the local communities and, I mean, a global network, but especially, I mean, in your personal experience, have you seen any patterns in, in the types of people that are, you know, volunteering and providing these services for their community? Yeah, that's a great question. So a little bit of background on Las Cruces, New Mexico. So we're a retirement community. So a lot of people are snowbirds in our community, meaning that they um, reside really in the Midwest, a lot of them, but have second homes um, or have retired in um, New Mexico. And so a lot of those folks um, joined the community because they didn't have um, family around and really wanted care and support. Um, so we had that demographic and then we had some younger folks or, um, people who had just retired and they were in their fifties and sixties, um, and were very much like me of, of a giving, um, mentality of, we want to volunteer, but we very quickly, um, made sure that people understood that this isn't just a volunteering job because a lot of times in volunteering jobs, you just show up, you hand something to someone and you walk away. Um, but this is a space where we truly want to build community um, and want to really have the tenant of reciprocity core at the core of everything that we do. So making people realize that when you're present within the space, it's not only what can you give, but how can you open yourself up to giving other people the possibility to also give to you um, creating that space. Because I had so many people who would rack up like a hundred points. And I would have to sit down, <laughs> sit them down and say, hey, I know that you really value your community members and you want to give, 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 but what can you receive? And so many of these people would say, no, honey, I'm not comfortable. I don't need anything. I'm so privileged that it feels wrong for me to receive when other people don't have as much as I do in the community. And so we really try to push that. So, yeah, um, I would say... So demographic wise, um, and also migrants that I said, so I said, I'm Iranian. I did some time banks in Farsi actually, which is really exciting for me personally, um, to have newly arrived graduate students from Iran who um, needed English help. They needed help writing cover letter and resume. We would connect people in the um, community to teach them these skills. Um, and then they were able to um, also provide skills to them. So it was cool to see that. And also one thing, we also were cognizant of it just being for people over the age of 18. If a minor did want to join, they would have to join with a parent. That makes sense. Yeah, thank you. Um, I think you're still, you're still sharing your screen, but I have one more question. Uh -huh. um, what is the average time? I know it depends on points, but what's the average time that people spend volunteering, um, like volunteering their time to the time bank, um, especially, I mean, in your, in your community? Um, yeah, that's a good question. It really varied, to be honest. Um, some people gave a lot. I mean, some people would give like up to 15 hours a week. Um, it really depended. And so we would have sometimes larger group activities too that people were able to rack up a lot of points. So for instance, we all, so we would have um, monthly potlucks as well. We would invite all of our community members. We'd be at the park in our office. We'd all come together, do an activity. And I remember Florence, a 94 year old woman in our time bank, she was telling me that day, yeah, my landlord just, um, hyped up my rent. I don't think I can stay here for another month. 
And in that moment, I shared it with the person next to me. And then the person next to me, and the next thing we knew, and like 10 minutes later, 10 of us had all agreed to help her find another apartment um, in the span of two weeks and help her move out of her trailer. And so we helped her um, acquire housing, and we all showed up. And for hours, I mean, this woman had lived there for years, um, packed up everything and moved her. And so we were able to all acquire um credit through that, each of us, um, a few hours in a group activity as well. So it really depended. And then for her in exchange, I remember she felt super intimidated by that at first of how am I ever going to repay all these people? You all shouldn't come over because I feel um, it feels unfair to me. And so I made her, I like sat her down and we spoke about how much of a value her presence is. I mean, she was just like such a gentle figure, having no family in this country, having an elderly in the space of at the time bank um, brought me so much comfort that we actually gave her credit for being just present within our potlucks because she brought so much joy to us. Um, and then she would do storytelling. So I'd invite her to over to my home and she would tell stories to my three roommates and I, um, which is really fun. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I want to open it up to um, questions from the community, if anyone has any. I was curious to know, how do you verify the volunteers if they're safe and secure? So, for example, in UK, you have DBS checks, which is a long, lengthy process. Uh, but, but how do you do it in US or any other countries you have volunteers? So do the background check of the volunteers if they're safe, safe and secure, you know? Are, uh, do we do background checks? Is that what you're? Sorry, one more time. You broke out. Yeah. Uh, if if you do background checks, and if you do, then how? And and what are the problems? And what is your experience there? That's a great question. So some time banks do do background checks, and those time banks usually charge a membership fee. So some time banks um they require you to pay like twenty um bucks a year to be a part of the time bank. We did not have a budget for this work. We did not get paid for this work. All of the work that we did was um, free. So we um, didn't really have the capacity to do background checks. And even if we did, we didn't think that there was value in doing background checks. Because for instance, if we did a background check now and someone did something, because um, many people stay in time banks for years, um, it could be invalid in a year if something happened. Um, so what we really um, did instead was we had a required orientation where we met all of these time bank members and we tried to really build the sense of um, respect and understanding with them right there and then. Uh, this is These are your expectations if, if you want to be present within this community. And yeah, we had some issues come up. Like we had people who would get into arguments people who had misunderstandings. And that's where um, conflict mediation came into play. So um, both my director and I, we both um, took some lessons in conflict mediation. We would bring people into the office and help mediate those spaces uh, to provide them a neutral ground if there was disputes. Um, and so, no, we didn't, but some time banks do have background checks. And so uh, one more thing. So especially the elderly were really nervous about having people come into their homes. Yeah. So we always encourage people for your first exchange with someone new who you haven't met because a lot of the people would build community at our potlucks. So they knew each other. Um, but for those that you didn't know, and it was someone random on uh, online who messaged you and said, hey, I can come cook a meal for you. We would encourage them not to do that for their first exchange. We would say, hey, meet at a coffee shop, meet somewhere in the library. A lot of people would meet at the library. Build some sort of mutual respect for each other and understanding, or at least have someone else at home um, when that person does come. So when you're comfortable with them, then have more private one-on-ones with them. Cool. Thank you. I have a lot of follow-up questions. I'll keep asking. These sure. Questions. Yeah. Awesome. And there is a website, Time Bank USA. Um, and as well as a Facebook page where a lot of people connect on that and ask questions if you're ever interested in creating your own. Okay, thank you. So if you just Google Time Banks USA, um, it will come up. There's actually a really great video of an example of one in New Jersey um, in the US um, that shows kind of the time bank in play. 
Sounds good. All right. Uh, thank you. And Ishan, if you have follow-up questions, go for it. Uh, if you want to. <laughs> um, yeah. So my second question was like, when you have more scale, more volunteers, I mean, like, how do you manage this on scale? Are you using any tools? Are you using any method, protocol? Is it like, because like I, I researched, I just Googled and there's a time bank in UK as well. So you have different chapters, different places. places. So you have any standard method of operating or it's like people manage themselves in their different ways? So like managing the time bank, who manages that? Is that your question? Yeah, how do you manage big teams? Like, like the volunteers, it's huge. And as you said, for me, in my work, security is a big concern because I work with disabled people and I want to engage them with volunteers. So, yeah, but, but my security is one aspect, but like when you have people in scale, I have like 100 people, 200 people interacting. Do you have any particular method to manage them or like you have you use tools or is, is, what do you do there? Yeah, that's a great question. Yeah, um, UK has a lot of time banks, and I would really encourage you to reach out to their coordinators to see how they're doing it there. Um, so for us, we would um, manage it, my director and myself. So we were grant funded. Initially, we had no funds to do this, and it was kind of overwhelming to keep everything up. Um, but we were grant funded for this work. Some time banks, like I said, in Dane County, they get even funds from the local government to do this work. Um, or able to get funding through other organizations. So for us, it was me, myself, my director, and then we had student um, college interns. Um, we had some social workers who were in the group trying to understand social cohesion and caring for people. We had some students who were um, health professionals. And so they would help us really manage the time bank. And so when it came to um, the exchanges, it was really nice to have that virtual database. But we weren't having to help people make every single exchange, but they were able to privately message each other. So a lot of times exchanges would happen that I wouldn't even know about. But it was all recorded on the online system, so I could always have access and go in and say, oh, that's great. Um, Shivani and Jenny connected today. That's awesome. Um, so I would have access to that information. Um, and then I had some people who would call me, for instance, um, the day before a flight, um, transportation fell through and they would say, oh my gosh, can you please help me find a ride to the airport tomorrow morning? And that's when social media would come into play or having people's, um, people would have the opportunity to share their um, emails and phone numbers on the website if they so chose to. And so I would um, actually had a running list of people of if there is emergency need for rides, who would be able to like step up? And so I'd always go back to those lists. So we would create like a list of niche um, request two of people who had certain skills and traits that I knew that I could go back to every time. So I'd usually just call those people really quick and say, can you give them a ride? Um, so that's what we would usually do. Um, right now, there's about 300 people in the time bank um, down there that I'm not, no longer a part of. Um, and yeah, it does get hard. The more and more people you have, the more conflict can rise, the more management you need to have. Um, but we also came to the point where we realized that we can't micromanage healthy community communities are messy um things come up and you just need to let it flow and be natural because we didn't want it to be so structured um to the point where i just felt like overwhelming of i need to abide by all these rules in order to be a part of this community no we wanted to be natural and freeing for people um cool thank you thank you for answering that sure thank you Thanks for your question, Nishan. I'm going to open up to the rest of the community. I know we have students, um, people in education, people in, I mean, technology, just business professionals. So um, do you guys have questions for Frisa? Uh, as a business owner, can is it advisable to uh, get a volunteer or to have a volunteer uh, in my in operation of my business? and uh, it requires to have uh, distribution channels. Now, is it advisable for me to use uh, volunteers as uh, like most especially student volunteers uh, as my agents or should they, should they be uh, um, personal or um, sorry, um, employed uh, staff? 
That's a good question. So what, by distribution channels, what do you mean by that? Okay, like uh, I'm into paint production and I have channels to different communities where I uh, supply these uh, uh, products. So often we have problem of having people that we can always give uh, this uh, product to, to help us uh, uh, distribute it in their own community. Mm -hmm. So uh, we always have challenges of uh, staff that always want us to pay them more than uh, the company is even uh, earning. So I'm not asking for a company like that, is it advisable for us to go for a volunteer that, uh, and if yes, then uh, how can we compensate that such volunteer? That's a great question. Um, one clarifying question. So are you selling this product to people? Yes, we are. Okay. So that gets a little tricky. So when money gets involved, it gets a little tricky. Each time bank um, has their own kind of way of doing things. So this, I love that you brought up this question because it reminded me of another portion of our time bank that I didn't share. So we had companies, um, we had businesses, we had local community groups who would join our time banks as groups, as like member group, I forget, or organizational members, that's what it was. You can be an individual member or organizational member. And so we had a group that was actually um, called Beloved Communities. So Ashan, going back to what you had shared with working with the disability, um, um, individuals who have disabilities, we had a group called Beloved Communities. So they wanted their um, members of their group as a collective unit to be a part of the time bank. So they were able to invite people from our community to join their events. Um, their members of their community would come and do things in the time bank. And we also had organizations um, join. So, for instance, there was a local veterans group who needed volunteers for this um, fundraising day that they were doing and needed volunteers to help set up, take down, do all these different things. And so they joined our time bank and people from our group were able to um, go to their event and volunteer. And so they didn't pay them anything. But their organization then later on, um, by paying them, I meant like monetarily, but they got points through the time bank. And later on, that veterans group did a huge exchange for our group, uh, um, a gathering that we had. And so with your organization, if you're looking for volunteers, I think there is a way for you to create um, some sort of model where you're able to tap into the power of a time bank, get volunteers to join um, your um, distribution links, but you cannot pay them monetarily. So that's something that's really important to keep in mind. We cannot get money mixed in here. So we did have moments where, for instance, we had a woman who um, was um, a housekeeper. And so she provided that talent of, if you need someone to clean around your house, I will do that for you. So she would go and clean people's homes. Um, and it got to the point where this gentleman said, wow, you're doing such a good job. I want to start paying you. It feels uncomfortable for me not to even tip you. So we had a conversation with them. And then we said, you two are more than welcome to continue these exchanges. But this needs to be outside of the realms of the time bank. So now you can pay her outside of the time bank. So that was actually a good way for people who had just come out of prison, who wanted um, work experience that were they weren't able to get otherwise. So we had a lot of people who built their trades as landscapers, and there's a lot of trade and um, jewelry makers, a lot of these different trades, and um, for them to build these skills, and then they were able to put it on their resume to say, I have these skills that I've now acquired, and then they're able to get paid for it outside of the time bank. We never wanted to get money currency involved in this system. Yes, thank you. Any more questions? We have a couple of new people on the call as well. Feel free, don't feel shy. Hi, this is Maribel, I have a question. Awesome. So um, I have two questions. If um, I'll ask the first one, if people have a burning question, then I'll ask the second one later. So the first one is about um, how you were able to connect such diverse communities. So in the beginning, you mentioned um, having uh, groups who were actually um, in Mexico kind of migrating during different seasons, and you had groups, indigenous groups, and 
I was just really impressed by the amount of diversity in your community. So I just want to hear a little bit about that because in the work with Love for Immigrants, uh, we have diverse groups of, of course, immigrants, but uh, sometimes they don't interact and it's sort of hard to get people out of their own communities to do something together. Yeah, that's a really good question. That was hard. Um, it was really uncomfortable. You can tell that when people show up to our potlucks, they would kind of migrate into little groups that they're most comfortable in. Um, but my director is the most like bubbly person you can think of. So we would do a lot of activities that put people out of their comfort zones. Um, and people kind of knew that about us. Um, that we were weird and quirky and we did things that was just fun. So we try to do a lot of things that were really creative. So our time make actually created three community murals during the time that I was there. One of them we actually painted in the middle of the street without permission from the city. We like fought it on them um, for like months, but we ended up painting this mural in the middle of the street that really allowed adults and kids to come together and like tap into their creativity. Um, I can have Shivani even send out the photo if you all are interested in seeing it. Um, but we did that. We did another um, mural right after um, a lot of the ice raids were happening. We did um, a traveling mural um, that really brought in the community of sharing like, love and affection. And a lot of our um, youth who had disabilities were a part of that mural too. So it brought people together um, on that. And so it was, I had to have hard conversations sometimes. We had people who were a part of the community who would say blaming and racist things to me as the coordinator too. Um, multiple times I had conversations with people of, hey, this is a space of respect. Um, we had people using like derogatory terms towards like other people. And so we had to really um, create ground rules. So we had ground rules written on like pieces of paper around the office. We always central um, like centered ourselves around these rules. Um, which made some people uncomfortable, to be honest. Uh, I feel like um, I don't want to abide by that. And um, it made them feel um, like, like for instance, one woman had like said really derogatory things about Iran and told me that like I should be grateful that I wasn't born in a savage country like that. Like she literally told me that during an orientation. And so when I spoke to her afterwards about how that made me feel, she was very uncomfortable that I had called her out about it. And she just kind of laughed. Um, I didn't see her for about a month. And then she returned into the space. Um, and we had a really great conversation about that afterwards. And so um, I think for us, we weren't afraid of having difficult conversations um, in a mindful and respectful manner. Um, I didn't call her out in front of the group. I pulled her aside afterwards and told her how I, uh, that made me feel. So I think having really strong um, conflict mediation skills and knowing like how to appropriately um, handle discomfort was really something that I learned to um, grow in a lot. Um, and I think was at the core of like building strong diverse communities and making sure that we didn't tokenize anybody either. Um, like people coming in from Mexico, a lot of people would view them as like, oh, these like exotic people from across the border came over. And so we had these conversations of like how harmful that is to, and um, really make sure that we're mindful of people um, like people would like make comments about people's accents and stuff like that of just really being at the core of this is an inclusive space and we are not going to make someone feel like an other. We have time for about one more question. We have two minutes left. Um, so I don't know if Maribel, you want to finish this off or if someone has any other questions that they would like to ask Parisa. And we'll always, um, I'll loop you guys into an email afterwards in case you have follow up questions as well. So uh, I was hoping someone else could ask a question so I don't um, overwhelm everyone with questions. But my last one is a little bit um, more, I guess, challenging. I recent, not recently, but a while back, actually, I read an article about how there's a this relationship between privilege and time banks, and how it could continue perpetuating um, 
these inequities. Like if someone has a bit more privilege, maybe uh, some more wealth that allows them to have time uh, versus someone that has to work two jobs, who's maybe like, um, you know, middle class or lower middle class or just working class and they have to work really hard. They might not be able to uh, be part of the community or put in the time um, in ways that they can also benefit and receive. So I just wanted to hear your thoughts on that since your time back is especially focused on equity. That's a great question. So some time banks require their members to give and to receive a certain amount. And we didn't have regulations on that, recognizing that some people were in stages of life and um, had a lot more privilege to be able to give. And whereas some people really need to receive a lot more in that stage of their life, for instance, that 94-year-old woman, she felt a lot of pressure on her initially of, I need so much. Um, I feel a little uncomfortable being in this space if I'm not able to reciprocate as much as I'm receiving. And so we try to create a space of recognizing and like putting that um, into words for people of please don't feel that pressure and we recognize that we all have different capacities to give and to receive um, but we try to encourage them to do both as much as they can so for those um especially migrants who had just arrived had to pay so much for their asylum case fees already um have very little in their pockets um and are working so hard to just provide for their families um we recognize that. And so I was very intentional with those families that I would go to them to even do orientations, recognizing that many of them didn't have transportation or time to come to the orientations that we were setting up. So I would go to their home, set that up for them. And um, we also um, provided opportunities for them to um, make exchanges in ways that were most comfortable for them. So a lot of migrants needed um, help with accessing resources to um, them being so busy that I'm um, really trying to help them incorporate self-care into their lives. So I had a lot of um, people saying like, I'm so overwhelmed by this journey to the US. Um, I just need to be able to relax. So I would call up ladies who I knew that could do people's nails. So we would give them like manicures and like gatherings like that, that were um, a space where they felt like, they were able to just breathe and like take a break from working so much and just like being in a state of like really high tension in the border region um, during a time where deportation rates were so high. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, they would gift in the capacities they were able to give. Um, and sometimes we would even give them credit for just being present within a time bank potluck recognizing that it took a lot of effort for them to be present there and that sometimes they'll just make a meal and bring it there and we'll give them credit for that meal and um, to make them still feel really valued and welcome. Thank you, Parisa. And thank you, Maribel, for those questions. Um, it looks like we're getting to that time where we have to wrap up and I do want to respect everyone's time. Um, thank you, Parisa, for sharing like the direct impact that time banks make and um, I'm sure this was a new concept for many people including me you told me a little bit about it, your experiences before but um, to hear it in this detail was great um, thank you everyone for joining for around the world um, I'm going to send out a survey after this video session if everyone can please share your thoughts um, and uh, check out our new Instagram page humans inspiring impact um, we love to feature people who are making a positive difference like Parisa is. Um, but thank you. Thank you so much for joining this call. Stay safe and healthy during this time. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.